Matthew this Turn to the book of Matthew, if you would, please. Matthew chapter number 9. Matthew chapter number 9. And we've been teaching and preaching with the exception of last Wednesday evening on the subject of what the Bible says about. What the Bible says about. And, of course, we've dealt with um, a couple of different things. Uh, what the Bible says most importantly about itself, because everything that we believe has to come from truth. And truth is the Word of God. And we have to, we have to understand that, that we have to decide. You're never going to convince someone of truth until they understand the source of truth is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if they're getting their information from a different source, they're going to have a hard time believing the truth. And so we have, to, we have to understand that what the Bible says about itself. And then we spoke on what the Bible says about same-sex marriage and what the Bible says about alcohol. And I believe we can go to the Bible and get the answers to the things that we deal with or we have questions to in life. And it should be the first place that we go to. The Bible should be the first place that we go to. And so we're going to continue that this evening with this subject and this thought, what the Bible says about abortion what the Bible says about abortion. And uh, I want to say to you that uh, I believe the Bible is very clear in this matter. I don't believe that there's any, um, you, if you have to or you desire to some way try to justify uh, someone who opposes a biblical view of abortion, then you're not using truth or the, or the Bible to do it. Uh, you're using the opinions of men because I believe the Bible is very clear on the issue. And we're going to get into it. And I'll just go ahead and tell you up front, this is going to be a two-part message, okay? This is going to be a two-part message. But what the Bible says about abortion. How many of you seen, uh, how many of you watch the news? Would you raise your hand? You watch the news? How many of you watch the news? I, I don't watch the news on purpose. Um, I just don't. Uh, it, it makes me angry. So I just don't watch it. And if something's going on that I need to be aware of, I, I usually skim the headlines, but I don't, uh, I, make, I don't make it a habit of watching the news. I, I believe most people in the media deserve to be in the loony bin. It's just where I feel about it. And if you're a Anderson Cooper fan or a Ted Koppel fan, is Ted Koppel still alive? Is he still around? He's still around? Amen. I just, I'm sorry, they just, sometimes they just are nuts that are screwed on the wrong bolts, and I just leave it at that. But I did have something come across my desk this week, and intending and, and to preach on this subject, I thought it was interesting that it, it came out this week, but I want to read it to you, and I just want to read this to you. I'm going to make some statements, and then I'm going to go to the Word of God and make some introductory statements as we approach this issue, okay? How many leave the Bible is the Word of God? Say Amen. Amen. Very good. Planned Parenthood called for a Disney princess who's had an abortion. Planned Parenthood calls for a Disney princess who's had an abortion. Planned Parenthood, the Planned Parenthood branch in Pennsylvania called for a Walt Disney company to create an animated princess who has had an abortion. As a matter of fact, the, the call from the Planned Parenthood was not just so that the Disney company would create a Disney princess that has had an abortion, but it went on to say we need a Disney princess who is pro-choice. We need a Disney princess who is an undocumented immigrant. We need a Disney princess who is actually a union worker. And we need a Disney princess who is transgender. Now, I want to, I want to, I, I'm trying the best, I, I'm, I'm going to try my best to help help some of us. I've said it over and over again. The media and society and the culture that we live in, as a matter of fact, you can look that up and read that article for yourself if you'd like to, if you believe Pastor Brian's trying to take and just use something for the benefit of a message. But the media and the culture has, is, and you've heard me say it over and over again, they are not going to change my mind. Do you, think it's, do you think it's by accident that Planned Parenthood, who, by the way, in our brand new $1.3 trillion budget, was given $500 million? 
Do you believe by mistake that they address the issue of abortion or being transgender or pro-choice or some of these other things? Do you believe it was by accident that they used Walt Disney to do that? I can tell you it's not. Because here's the problem. It's sad that the culture and society and the enemies of righteousness are fighting harder for our children than we are. They are going to every extreme to impact their way of thinking. Every decision has a ripple effect. How many of you ever, how many of you ever thrown a, a rock into a body of water? Man, ever skipped rocks? Man, you can have a, 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 a body of water that's as smooth as glass, and you can throw one rock into it, and that ripple effect impacts the whole lot. And pastor gets up, and he preaches, and he teaches on some of these things, and he, he's very adamant about what truth is. And, and everything that I've preached on these Wednesday evening services has been taken from the Word of God. Hasn't been my opinion. I believe the Bible is very clear. But I believe some of us need to be aware that the devil is doing all that he can to impact the thinking of our young people. Do you believe it's by accident that you see Walt Disney? Now listen, I'm not knocking Walt Disney. That's not the issue. I'm knocking Planned Parenthood. Amen? Amen. Do you, do you think it's by accident, though, that children's shows now are incorporating two moms and two dads? That books that are designed to be written for children have that those issues, are addressing those issues in the lives of children. Do you think that is happening by accident? I'm telling you it's not. The devil is trying to impact the way these young ladies, these young men, the generation that, that we are trying to train in the back this evening, he is doing all that he can to impact their thinking. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Just recently I was listening to a conversation that a young lady, a uh, young teenage girl was having with a young teenage boy about the issue of homosexuality. And you could hear the indoctrination of the culture and of society being repeated from the mouth of this young lady. She was saying things and she was speaking about things that you could tell she had heard someone else say. And the devil is doing all he can to impact the way that these young people are thinking. And the devil, sad to say, is fighting harder for them to go the wrong direction than we are for them to go the right direction. That bothers me. That concerns me. Because the church that we now worship in and the church and Christianity that we now enjoy is one, one generation away from extinction. One generation. Here's how it's going to happen. The devil is going to get a hold of the hearts and minds of your children. And the sad thing is, is that so many times we'll get upset at the messenger, and we'll get upset at the preacher, we'll get upset at somebody who's trying to stand for righteousness rather than getting upset at the real issue, and that's Satan's desire to have our children. I don't think that the, that the devil works by accident. He works on purpose. And I believe we must deal with the truth. We must deal with the truth. I know that these are issues and these are topics and these are things that are very... Uh, very, uh, it, it can get very edgy. People have certain opinions, and we live in a world today where every one of us knows somebody who's involved in homosexuality. And somebody says, well, are we supposed to hate those people? You've never heard Pastor Brian say anything about hating homosexuals. And if you say that, you're lying. 
We're to hate the sin. This is part of my introduction. I want you to take your Bibles and look at Matthew chapter number 9. Matthew chapter number 9. Matthew chapter number 9. And look with me, if you would, please, down at verse number 36. Actually, verse 35. Matthew chapter number 9, verse number 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then he saith unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. The Bible says also, turn with me if you would please, hold your place there in Matthew chapter number 9, and turn with me if you would please to the book of 2 Timothy. To the book of 2 Timothy. I wasn't planning on reading this passage of Scripture, but I'm going to, uh, I believe we'll read it just to see. Just see if we can make it work here. All right? 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Second Timothy chapter number 4. Of course, 2 Timothy chapter number 3, the Bible teaches us that evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. The world's going to get darker. And it's, when you think it can't get any worse, it's going to get worse. And here's how Paul tells Timothy to respond. He says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but they will, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I have fin finished my course and I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. That love his appearing. Look in verse number 3. For the time will come, well, go back to verse number 2, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. The Bible says that the time will come in 2 Timothy. I would say to you today, the time is now. Churches are growing by leaps and bounds that preach no doctrine. They will not endure sound doctrine. Listen to me. But after their own lust shall heap to themselves who? Teachers. They'll be drawn to teachers that don't step on their toes, that don't contradict how they live, that never upset the apple cart, having itching, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. There's a progression that takes place in 2 Timothy here where the Bible says that they'll not endure sound doctrine. They'll say, you know what, they, they used to maybe sit in church and they used to agree with what the preachers say and they used to, to, to stand and line up with what the Bible said. Now, let, me, let me just go back. They used to agree with what the Bible said and they used to agree with what God said and they used to line up where the Bible lined up. And, and now the Bible says they don't like that, they won't endure that. And the Bible says they'll go find somebody that'll tell them what they want to hear. You want to find somebody that'll tell you what you want to hear, you won't have to look far. You'll find somebody that'll tell you what you want to hear. But the Bible says it ain't truth. It's not truth. Be very careful about your flesh and the lust of the flesh. The Bible says their own lust, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes of pride of life, desiring what you want instead of what God wants for you. He says they'll find someone to tell them what they wanted to hear and get, guess what happens? 
after they find someone that will tell them what they want to hear, they will no longer listen to the truth. I didn't say that. God said that. Look at what it says. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into what? What's the word? What is that? What's a fable? What's the, what's the, what is the, what is the plain spoken word for fable? A lie. The Bible says they'll begin to believe a lie. There's a progression. I don't really agree with that. I don't like that. Here, here's the point. Man, I, this is the introduction to the introduction to the introduction, all right? Here's the point. When we start getting at to a place in our life where we don't like what the Bible is saying, when we get to a place in our life where we, we have to, I have to really work at agreeing with what the Bible says. When we get to that place in our life, we're at a dangerous crossroads. Because here's the choice that you're going to make when you don't like what the Bible says. You're either going to choose to get right or you're going to choose to go in opposite direction. And when you start that, that enduring, I don't, I don't like that. You hear, when you start moving away from truth, it won't be long before you'll begin to believe a lie. That's what the Bible says. Isn't that what Timothy said? Isn't that what Paul wrote to Timothy? Do I need to read it again for you? Oh, Pastor, it'll never get to that point. It'll never get to that point. It'll, it'll, never, it, it'll never happen to me. There have been more that are far stronger than you and I in the Christian life that it's happened to. And they're no longer in the battle for the Lord. Paul said later on, he said, I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I've kept the faith. There have been many that have departed from the faith. Timothy deals with it in, in 1 Timothy chapter number 4. But there's a progression that takes place. I don't like it. Here's the warning I'm giving you. When you don't like what the Bible says, get right. When you don't like what the Bible says is truth, get right. Change your heart. That's a warning. Because if we don't, it won't be long before we'll begin to believe a lie. We'll begin to believe a lie. Some of these issues that we deal with, some of these issues that we talk about, they involve people. Can I tell you that ministry and God's work is always about people? Ministry and God's work is always about people. And there is no depth, there is no darkness to which you can go to that the light of God's word cannot draw you out of. Let me say that again. Because if we don't believe that, we got other problems. There is no depth that you go to and there is no darkness that you can slip into that the light of God's word cannot draw you out of. God saves sinners. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm not saved because of who I was or where I came from. I'm saved because of the grace of God. And that grace of God is extended to all men. But in dealing with some of these subjects, we have to deal in our mind, we relate them to people. And I'm so thankful that we serve a God that is gracious. I'm thankful that we serve a God that is able to forgive. I'm so thankful that when God forgives, He never brings them up again. Aren't you thankful for that? How often in our life do we bring them up? How often do maybe family members bring them up? And how often do we point out the faults and failures of other people? But God says when you make it right, when you confess that sin, He's faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He says He, he doesn't bring them up anymore. I'm thankful that I have a God that forgives. I'm thankful that I know people who struggled with the sin of homosexuality and have overcome that sin and are now living for God. I'm thankful that I know people who have, who have struggled with other sins in their life. And by the way, every one of us struggle with sin. Your sin may not be alcohol and your sin may not be pornography and your sin may not be drinking or your sin may not be homosexuality, but every one of us struggle with sin. And I'm thankful that God is able to help us overcome that sin and we can live a victorious life. I know people who've had abortions 
And they struggle with the ripple effect in, that, in their life. But I'm here to tell you today that God is able to forgive and God's grace is extended. The Bible says in Matthew, go back there if you would please, we talked about the departure from the truth and we see how Paul tells Timothy they're, they're not going to endure the truth. They're not going to like the truth. They're not going to like, Timothy, what you say. And here's the, here's the statement that we often hear so, so many times. Here's the statement that we hear and, and we should hear that and, and, and it's something that needs to be sounded forth from the pulpits because preachers often struggle with it. But in Matthew chapter number 9, verse number 36, the Bible says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion on them. I want to give you some statements about truth and compassion because I want you to understand your pastor's heart. I want you to know Pastor Brian Cooper, I haven't pastored you for 34 years, but I want you to know my heart and I want you to hear from my lips where I'm coming from. Compassion must always be a part of our message. Number one, I want you to write this down. We should always speak the truth in love. We should always speak the truth in love. The Bible says in Timothy there that they will depart from the truth and heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they won't endure the truth. And so many times we, if we're honest, those that are delivering the truth are partly to blame because we want to speak the truth without compassion. But the Bible tells us that we're to speak the truth in love. As a matter of fact, write it down. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. I'm going to turn there and read it for you because I want you to hear it, all right? Uh, Ephesians 4, I think I can find it. Ephesians 4, look in verse number 15 and 16. Listen here if you would, please. The Bible says, But speak the truth in love. But speak the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Speaking the truth in love. We're to speak the truth in love. I believe that with all my heart. I try, I desire to be a compassionate preacher. I desire to be a compassionate pastor. I don't think that we're to preach the truth in anger. I don't believe we should preach the truth about sin and eternity as if we're glad that people are going to hell. I don't believe we should give off that spirit or that attitude. We should speak the truth in love. Speak the truth, speaking the truth in love will always accomplish the best in a person's life. Not only is the best way, it's the biblical way. The Bible says speak the truth in love. Matthew tells us in Matthew chapter number 9 that we just read it. The Bible says that when Jesus saw the multitudes, He was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion on them. Why? Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. In this verse, we see compassion and truth interwoven. We see Christ set the example of how we're to, to deliver the truth with compassion. He says He was moved with compassion on them. Why? Because they fainted. They were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Can I give you something else? Not only must truth be delivered with compassion, and truth must be delivered in love. We should speak the truth in love. But I want you to get this. That truth without compassion breeds contempt. Truth without compassion breeds contempt. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter number 6. Turn there if you would please, all right? I want you to take your Bibles and turn there. Ephesians chapter number 6. I think it's interesting that some of these topics, 
some of these subjects, some of these important matters like truth and compassion and, and what is truth. God uses the home to, to teach those principles. Look what he says in Ephesians chapter number 6. Look in verse number 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Why should we obey our parents, children? Because it's right. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. I'm soon to be 41 years old. My mom's sitting in the church service. I still honor her to this day. You don't ever grow up and not have to honor mom and dad. As a matter of fact, if you don't honor them, the Bible says in verse number 3, that it may be well with thee that thou mayest live long on the earth. When we don't honor mom and dad, God says, I cut days off your life. That's what he said. I don't know that I believe that. That's the truth. And you fathers, what does he say? What's the next word? Provoke. Not your children to what? That word provoke there means to incite. That word provoke means there to stir. He says, don't incite, don't stir your children to wrath. You say, Pastor Brian, how's that happen? Here's how it happens. When we deliver the truth without compassion. When we deliver the truth without compassion, we provoke our children to wrath. We incite anger. We make them upset. We get them bothered because we, we, we proclaim truth without compassion because truth without compassion breeds contempt. Well, I, I, I can deliver the truth. I see sometimes I, I remember growing up and I remember, uh, you know, I played Little League Baseball. How many of you play Little League Baseball, play Little League Baseball or coach Little League Baseball or you're a parent of a Little League Baseball player? Some of the most interesting people at Little League baseball games are not the kids. They're the moms and dads. How many have ever seen that dad who believes that his four-year-old son is going to be the next Dale Murphy? And man, he's out on the field, mom's out on the field, and man, they're yelling and cussing and screaming. And, and, and maybe the kid's up there batting and he strikes out. You know, he's, he's three years old. His helmet's four times too big for him. The bat's longer than he is. He can barely get it around. And dad believes he's supposed to be a superstar. And when he strikes out, dad flips out. We'll sometimes act the fool about things we shouldn't act the fool about. We'll sometimes incite things in our kids. Do, do you want him to hit a home run? The truth is, yeah, you want him to hit a home run. But the fact is, he's probably not going to do it. And we'll get, we'll get to delivering truth without compassion. When we discipline our children in anger, we breed contempt. When we handle a matter unwisely, when we lose our temper, when we get upset, when we... When we Act in a way that this pleases the Lord, and we can be very specific in those areas. When we do that, we do not accomplish what God desires to accomplish in their life. We're to preach the truth in love, but when we preach it without compassion, it breeds contempt. It incites and it stirs away from God. See, Pastor Brian, why are we talking about these kinds of things? Because the devil's going to tell some of you that Pastor Brian just angry about everything. Why do we deal with these subjects? Why don't we just come and we talk about all the good things that God's given us and we could talk about that forever. But we have to deal with the attack of the devil on our homes, on our children, on our churches, on our country. Preaching the truth without compassion breeds contempt. The third thing that I want you to get this evening is this. Look with me if you would please in the book of Jude. Turn there if you would please. The book of Jude. Right before the last book of the Bible. Keep yourselves, verse number 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have what? Making a what? Making a difference. And others say with fear, pulling out of the fire, even the garment spotted 
by the flesh. The third thing that I want you to get about truth and compassion tonight is, number one, truth must be delivered with compassion. We're to speak the truth in love. The second thing is truth without compassion breeds contempt. The third thing that I want you to get is this. Compassion without truth is a lie. Compassion without truth is a lie. The Bible says, and some have compassion, making a difference, saving, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Let's go back to little Johnny and little Susie. Little Johnny and little Susie come to mom and daddy one day, and they have found, it's, it's Thanksgiving time, and they have found the electric knife. Johnny and Susie throw a fit because they want to play with it. I want to play with it. I want to, I want to play with it. I want, and Mom and Dad say, well, I just want to be compassionate. So you run off over there and you play with it, okay? Be careful. I don't want to hurt your feelings. But, but you'll be okay. Compassion without truth is a lie. You know why pastors get up and they say, you must trust Jesus Christ as Savior? Because if you don't, you're going to die and go to hell. So in delivering truth, we're being compassionate. Because compassion without truth is a lie. I can't figure out, I can't figure out why I'm dealing with all these problems. Well, how, how, how's your relationship with the Lord? Oh, I don't want to deal with that. I want to, I want to deal with this over here. No, no, no. You can't deal with all the other issues until you deal with the issue. You can't deal with solving the problems of your life until you deal with where you are with the Lord. And if your life isn't right with God, you're not going to solve all those problems. I don't care how much you're petted and prodded and everybody wants to make you feel good. The issue is the relationship with Jesus Christ. And we say, well, what's the problem? Well, let's, just, let's just be compassionate. Let's not deal with the subject. Let's not deal with this issue. Let's not deal with this thing that, that is, incites people to maybe consider where they are. and Maybe things that they might not agree with. That. Let's just deal with things everybody agrees on. No, no, no. Because compassion without truth is a lie. And I pray the Lord takes me to heaven before I ever get behind that pulpit and be content with just loving everybody without preaching the truth. Because my compassion won't help you in eternity. The truth will. Compassion without truth is a lie. God said, speak the truth in love. As a matter of fact, if you look in Galatians, Galatians 4, He says, am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? Isn't it interesting who we make enemies out of? Stop for just a moment. Look here, please. We have one enemy. Understand that. Your family, sir, has one enemy. It's not the Sunday school teacher. It's not the youth pastor. It's not the pastor. It's the devil. That's the enemy. Am I your, am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? Can I tell you that every person who got upset because someone told them they were lost without Jesus Christ and needed to be saved, and that person got saved, I promise you, every one of them in eternity will be grateful. Compassion without truth is a lie. Can I tell you, you're not going to be okay if you do the best you can. You're not going to be okay as long as we overlook that or, or we overlook that issue or we overlook that sin and you just continue to do it for the sake of getting along, you're not going to be okay because the chickens will come home to roost. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. So we deal with subjects like this with compassion, but we deal with them truthfully. And we speak the truth in love. Pay attention to me, girls. But when we begin to get bothered by the truth, it's not because, or it should not be because, there's no compassion. It's because our life doesn't line up 
with what God said it should be. Don't let the devil rob you of the truth. You say, it'll never happen to me. Paul said it'll ha- it could happen to all of us in Timothy. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But will heap to themselves teachers. After their own lusts, heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they'll turn away their ear from the truth. There's a point in a person's life that man can go no further with him. There's a point in a person's life when man no longer has the ability to impact your heart. Only God does. Now I understand it's all God. But God uses people. I would hate for any of us, any of us, to arrive at a, at, a, at a place spiritually where God has to do something dramatic to get our attention. Say, it don't happen to me. It won't ever happen to me. What's the problem? The problem is not the messenger. The problem is not the message. The problem is our life needs to be what God wants it to be. Speak the truth in love. But just because we speak the truth doesn't mean we we lack compassion. Because compassion without truth is just a lie. Truth without compassion breeds contempt. That's why Jesus said he was moved with compassion. Why was he moved? Because they fainted. They were like sheep that had no shepherd. He revealed the truth. You're weak. You falter, you fail. But he was moved with compassion. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes if we could please this evening. I told you this message was going to be a two-part message. We deal with subjects that are very personal.